Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Paulo Souza. Uh, I do the I, I work on the engine evangelist in Brazil. Today we're going to talk a little bit about profiling and optimization in the Unreal Engine. So uh, the idea in this talk is not really go very deep in uh, how you're actually going to find out issues in your game. Of course, that we're going to cover that. But uh, the idea here is actually explaining why some of the problems may arise in your project, right? Explaining uh, some of the stuff behind the curtain in the engine so you know for sure the reason why some things are bad and not just like be throwing uh, random words like draw calls are bad or, GP or CPU use is bad. No, I, I actually try to give you a little bit, a, a bit bigger understanding on uh, what is behind, how things work so you can get a better understanding how, of, of what can cause issues. Of course, prevent an overview of the building tools that the engine has to help you on finding out those issues and uh, later sharing a few hints that we know from the field that uh, you can use in your own projects to help optimize uh, uh, performance issues in your game, right? But first, before we start, I would like to go a little bit over some, some important things and why you should have the control of the performance of your game, right? First of all, peace of mind is really important, right? Over the course of development, it's nice to know that your game is performing across uh, a large uh, number of platforms. It's also uh, very good when, you, when you're able to think about this, think about performance, think about uh, optimization since the very beginning of the project. And you really should really think, think, think of this like uh, an investment, right? Uh, the, the earlier you start doing an investment in your life, the bigger is going to be the lean way, the space that you have at the end of your life, or in our case, at the end of the, the development cycle, to add, maybe add more things to your game or actually be worried, actually be focused on, on the final stages of development, you know, the final tuning that you need to do at the end of the project to make it really great. It also adds, uh, is, uh, also makes the development easier, right? Uh, this may not be an, ex uh, an actually an issue for AAA developers uh, because most of the time have good amount of resources. But uh, in indie development, we know that you're buying your own hardware with your own money. You're making investment from your own pocket, and sometimes. Maybe you or some, uh, uh, someone in your team doesn't have access to buy the best hardware poss possible or all the amount of RAM and CPU. So uh, if you're able to control uh, the performance of, a ga of your game on the early stages of development, the, the faster, the better will be the development. So you'll be able to share your builds uh, to the other developers of, of your team. So you'll be able to send the project to uh, maybe musicians, sound designers across uh, the world, and they will be able to actually work on your project. And also, some uh, another thing that's really important, and that that gets really to the to the part of, to the word of the control of the performance. When you have control of the performance, when you're really optimizing your game, and not only it runs fast on lower end machines, but also runs great and beautifully in higher end machines, it makes your life much easier when you start thinking about getting to other platforms like consoles or even mobile phones. So this is, this is something that can add a lot of uh, peace of mind in development. But also, this guy, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, this John Linneman from Digital Foundry. Uh, John is also known in the gaming community as the protector of frame rates or the human fraps. And the thing is really, I mean, Digital Foundry is a great channel. You should definitely uh, watch it. The, 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 Great tech technical reviews, but the thing here, here is that I mean, if you don't have, if you don't focus on having great performance in your game, that will probably affect your reviews. So this is something that you should keep in mind. A few things before we start: uh, avoid thinking uh, that optimization is a later; it's the final step in your project. Optimization. I'm go probably going to repeat this over the course of this presentation a lot. Optimization is something that you have to think since the beginning until the end, right? It's not something that you can delegate to someone else, to a programmer or to a, a technical artist or something like that. It should be the responsibility of the entire team, should be the responsibility of whoever is adding content to the game, whatever that content that's getting into the engine, the person has to be responsible for that, right? 
And there is also a common mistake that some people, and that's, that doesn't only happen with indies, but sometimes even with AAA developers, that people think that the engine can optimize things for you. Yes, sometimes, very rarely, the engine will optimize things for you, but in most cases, you, you at least need to know uh, the issues that you're having so you will be able to set up the right features in the engine to get the best performance. So, no, throwing all your actors, buildings, vegetation in a single map and expecting that the engine will auto-optimize your open world game will not work. A few of the good practices. Uh, as I said before, the best optimizations begin with the, uh, start with the beginning of the project, the earliest. The early that you start doing that, the better. Uh, profile soon, profile often. Uh, this is a responsibility of everyone in the team, so avoid the janitor syndrome, right? Uh, should be the responsibility of whoever is working at that, in that asset, in that specific part of the game. That's, that, that's at least how this works at Epic internally. Uh, and as a project lead, if you're leading the project, uh, it's kind of like the responsibility of the project leader to make sure that everyone that is involved is aware of the basic profiling process. Right? Moving on, let's get to the nitty gritty. Usually when you start profiling your game, you start looking, okay, what is, what is, what is bringing my performance down? You, the first question you should ask yourself is, am I GPU or CPU bound, right? So is this a problem with my graphics uh, uh, unit or this is a problem with my CPU? And the very uh, first thing that you start, you should start when you identify a bottleneck using the stat unit command not just stat FPS because stat unit gives you the actual the time that it takes to render in a specific frame in your hardware. Uh, what it basically means is that the, 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 the green number, the frame number, shows you that the total time that your hardware took to render that a given frame. The game thread, we're gonna talk a lot about this, but the game thread is all of your C++ and B, or blueprint gameplay simulation. The draw thread is a CPU render time, and the, and the GPU thread shows you this, the GPU render time. And one thing that is interesting that you can look in this graph is that the frame time, it's not the sum of all these numbers. It's not the sum of all these times, and I'm gonna just explain you why. The reason is that these threads, they run, there are different threads, so they run in parallel. Right? And each of these threads, in order, they need the content, they need the result of the thread before this. Before we talk a little bit about that and how that works, a few things I would like to, I would like to share with you. Ideally, when you're profiling, when you're looking for bottlenecks in, the game, in your game, the closest that you're running your game to the target of hardware in the target environment the more precise is going to be the numbers that you're getting, right? So if possible, avoid profiling in the editor, right? If you're working on console platforms or mobile device, I mean, actually really avoid it because you're, you're not debugging in the actual platform and, and Unreal, I mean, for PC consoles, it works very similar in terms of uh, rendering, but for mobile, it uses the forward path, so it's completely different. So make sure that you're running, you're, you're using a cook, cook build and you're running on target hardware. If you're making your game for the PC, and if you really have to profile in the editor, make sure that you're playing, you're playing in standalone mode, make sure that you minimize the editor. Also, it's important to turn, turn off frame rate smoothing and also turn off vsync with a console command, vsync r.vsync equals zero. Okay, getting back to those threads, like, like I was saying before, those threads, they run in parallel, and that, as you continue your graph, uh, the game thread is going to do all its computing, right? And all that data that the game thread computes, it's going to be stored, and it's going to be used by the draw thread, which is going to figure out everything that doesn't need to render, doesn't need to go to the screen, and then after that's done, the GPU thread we will actually render the, the, the final pixels on the screen. So if any of these threads, any of these data, and, and if the time that it takes to compute any of these frames in each of these different threads, of course that the next stage will need to like basically wait for the previous one to finish so it can do its job. But uh, what exactly do, this, do these guys uh, do, right? The GPU, the CPU thread, the game thread, uh, literally 
takes care of the entire simulation of your game, right? Everything since the game logic, the positions of all the actors, the position of uh, everything in the scene, the animation, the actual animation frames, physics, AI, everything that is going to compute the final result of the world, the final situation of the world at a given frame, it's going to be processed, going to be computed in the game track, right? After that, uh, after that's finished, you have your entire world computed, so the engine know where everything is. Great. On the next step, the draw thread, it's going to filter out, it's going to cool everything that's not in the context of the camera that the engine is going to render. We use like many different methods for that, we get in a little bit more detail later, but it basically if everything is not in the context of the camera, we're going to filter out, and then we're going to create a list of all the objects, all the shaders, all the materials, textures, and everything that's going to be sent to the GPU. And then the GPU will get all this data, process all the vertex shaders, textures, everything, and write the final pixels uh, to the screen. A few tools that, tools that you can use. So you have these two commands, start FPS chart and stop. FPS chart, it basically gets that the output of this stat unit and uh, record this over time to a text file that's, that's literally in the CSV file that you can open in your favorite spreadsheet editor uh, and create a graph. This is really useful when you need to, let's say, try to find out what is causing a hitch in, your, in a given cutscene in your game, or you can actually even do some automated tests uh, maybe do a, a camera um, swiping around your level uh, and recording everything and then export that to a CSV and do that periodically, maybe every week or every night and, and you know, check for alerts or anything that may be causing spikes, spikes in your performance. Uh, the CPU profiler is also very useful. Uh, you can start recording uh, everything that the engine does, every command that the engine sends, even like draw calls, uh, using stat start file and stat stop file. Uh, this works in any development or testing build, so you can do that in mobile and consoles too. And what is really great is that this uh, also records to a file uh, that you can load back to your computer and open in the Unreal front end, and then you can analyze and go like for groups of ticks and ticks by ticks, go like deep further on a game thread and find out what can be causing uh, hitches and performance issues. Uh, we are also working on a new tool called Unreal Insights, which is somehow similar to the profiler, but uh, it's a standalone app, standalone program that you, you can run, it runs it can run in another process on your computer or you can run in another computer. And Unreal Insights has some quality of life uh, improvement. It makes it easier to add your own profile data using uh, traces in the code. And it finally can record data remotely. So right now it's still in beta in 4.23. Yes, as we progress in development, we're going to add support for more platforms, but you finally will be able to do that remotely over the network, and this is great. Okay, let's start talking about the game thread, right? Uh, like I said before, the game thread has to calculate all the logic, all the transforms, animations, object positions, literally everything that's related to the game logic and that's related to building the world needs to be calculated in the game thread, needs to be cal calculated in, on your CPU, right? And usually the culprit of performance issues in a game thread is uh, having a lot of complex logic on tick, right? As you know, probably, uh, tick are calculated every frame, right? It's literally the, the, the function that calculates the state of everything in the engine. But the fact is that blueprints, uh, at least gameplay blueprints, they rarely need to tick, right? Because most of the gameplay scripting, they are event-based or they don't necessarily need to be updated every frame. Of course, there are exceptions to that, but I mean, mostly you don't need to do that. And keep in mind that many actors sticking in your scene, in your world, will substantially slow down your game. A few commands that you can use, that game is awesome to, uh, to get a general idea of how long the, the gameplay ticks are taken in a given scene, in a given moment. And also the dump ticks command uh, gives you, prints you a list of actors that are actually ticking and a, a general, a number, a total number of actors ticking. 
And the thing here, I mean, we're really not trying to tell you that you should not use tick at all. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. I mean, if you actually need to have game logic on tick, uh, the only thing that we're, we're trying to tell you is that consider evaluating, before you add this complex logic to your tick function, consider evaluating if you actually really need that to be run, to be updated, updated every frame, right? There are many alternatives. Like I said before, you, you, you could probably do some of this stuff event-based, right, if they don't need to be updated like in a frequency, as frequent as you, you, you want it. Or if it needs to update it in a fixed frequency, you can use timers or maybe even reducing the tick rate of, the, of that specific blueprint, but you can use timers and, I don't know, maybe updating it every half of a frame, every quarter, even every tenth of a, sorry, of a second, and that will help you a lot with reducing uh, the performance use. You can also use timelines. You can also manually toggle actors that are not and maybe too far from the player. They're not in context. So just turn off ticking uh, when they're far and then re-enable when, when you're close to them. And like I said before, most of the time for gameplay events, you should be able to use event-driven systems. So keep that in mind. There are also, also some stuff that we are kind of like use as more comfortable to have them be updated uh, every frame, like a uh, visual effects, usually using a timeline or usually using a tick function, a function that runs on tick that's going to update a material parameter to give you some sort of pixel shader effect, right? And this is a great example. This is a, a damage animation, a shader animation. But some of these, uh, just if, if it's simple fades or, or simple animations like that, you're actually able to run those on the GPU, on the pixel shader, right? This is a very simple example. You're just like, you're just passing it like a start time once and the, the math will take care of itself of lurping between these two values. And you're not using your CPU thread at all. It's all running on a GPU, which is really fast for this kind of thing. Uh, we also do like a lot of, um, in game development, all of, a lot of uh, very simple looping uh, movement and objects. So uh, if it's not really gameplay related, if it's like more tied to making your level look nicer, give you a little bit more, a nicer appearance, I mean, you should probably consider moving those to the vertex shader or even use some sort of a native code to rotate and animate those. So the rotating moving component in C++ is a great example. It basically, it basically rotates stuff around itself. But if you really want to go crazy on performance, I mean, you can probably do that on the vertex shader using a rotate world about axis uh, material uh, function for that. We actually do that a lot internally at Epic. And speaking of expensive functionality, in general, we're not saying that you should not use those. Of course, that if they're that, you, you can't use. But uh, try to avoid uh, using functionality that's inherently expensive. But if you really need to use, use this with care. Uh, a great example is a get all actors of class. It's some, something that when you're starting using a real, you kind of like, it, it's, you, everyone has a tendency to abuse uh, using get all, all actors of class. Uh, if you really need to do that in an event-based uh, logic, maybe do that when the game starts or maybe do an uh, event-based thing that this only updates uh, when it actually needs to access the data. So just like caches everything to an array variable. So keep in mind that uh, these are the good practices. Also, if you need to use uh, for loops, make sure that uh, especially when they're nested, make sure that you're using uh, breakable loops so you don't need like to run all the all the other loops when you actually find what you're looking for. Spawning, uh, for the latest versions of the engine, we actually improved that a lot, but spawning actors, that's still something that uses a lot of your resources because that also going to uh, need to access the IO of the, the platform that you're using. So you should be aware and be careful when you're doing that a lot in the game. So consider also doing uh, pooling of actors in the scene. Um, and also it's important that uh, you know the construction script can add, can increase the spawn time of every actor. And like I said before, we really, we, we do not want to think, we do, we do not want you to think that you should not do things, complex things on tick. Uh, if you really, really need to do complex math, complex calculation on tick, consider moving them to native or to C++. 
right? This is not an actual, this is not a gameplay code example. This is from Fortnite and uh, an animation blueprint. But an animation blueprint, it's something that it's kind of similar a little bit to complex math that runs on ticks. So you, usually in an animation blueprint, you're getting few vectors and doing math and getting uh, results from th that math and, and using that to change animation. So if you really have like really complex math that you need to run on tick, consider moving to C++ to native. You can probably use the uh, blueprint net nativization features to test with that. If that gives you performance that's good enough, great. Uh, if you want to go to that last mile to get like the absolutely best performance, move to C++ and uh, native. And uh, of course, I mean, converting complex functionality in general is a great, good practice uh, when you're making an Unreal game. And Unreal Engine uh, provides you with a hybrid approach. You, don't, you, you can mix and match Blueprint and C++. Uh, you don't necessarily need to convert everything to C++. Maybe there is a specific part of your code that's really complex, that has really, needs to do like all kinds of complex computing. Move just that part to C++, expose that back to Blueprint as a function, and you're good to go. I don't want to go crazy on animation, but in general, animations uh, for the few less versions of the engine, animation, uh, uh, animation Blueprints got a lot of improvements in performance. If you're working on your, if you're working on a 3D game that uses an animation blueprint, make sure that using the fast path, uh, basically, the more you have of these lighting icons in your animation blueprint, the better. The draw thread, the next one. Okay, what does the draw thread do? Uh, like I said before, the draw thread gets the, your world, right, the result of the compute, computation of the game thread. The, that result has the entire world, right, that you, that, that's relative to the logic of your game. The draw thread is going to filter out everything that you don't need to render, right? Use many different techni techniques. You have first time cooling. Uh, depending on the platform, we were able to use hardware occlusion queries. Uh, that's not possible in mobile. Uh, and, I mean, a general term, I could say that uh, the more objects that you have in your scene, more problems that you can have, uh, so should be careful with that. Uh, and that's quite critical when op open or larger environments. So in general, you should be aware that in between 10 to 15,000 15, uh, objects, it's kind of like the limit of the hardware that we have today. Um, and so after that, after the, the engine knows what, what it needs to render, it's going to create a list of commands that's going to send to the GPU uh, and it's going to render these, these commands, it's going to render these parts of the scene draw call by draw call. But what exactly is a draw call? I, I usually like to explain the draw call thing using a different approach, right? I, using, I usually use the canvas span analogy, right? Imagine you have this scene on the left, right? And this scene is basically composed of a sky. It should be colored, I don't know why it doesn't have color, but Composed of a sky, let's say it's blue. You, you have this floor, like light gray floor, and you have three cylinders, three different objects, three different actors, three cylinders with the same material, right? How a GPU draws this, the way that the G, GPU draws this by default, it's something like this. So let's say I'm going to first start drawing the sky. So uh, imagine a canvas, like a white canvas, and then imagine a bucket of brushes, right? Every brush represents a color. So I need to write, I need to uh, draw my blue sky. I go to my bucket of brushes, I get the blue brush, I get back to the canvas, and I paint it down. That's great, right? So now I'm going to draw the floor, right? Uh, the uh, light gray floor. I go back to my bucket, put my brush, my blue brush down, get the light gray brush, brush get back to the canvas, and paint the floor. That's great. Let's start now drawing the columns, the, the cylinders, right? Same thing, get back to my brush, get the dark gray brush, get back to the canvas, and then I draw the first cylinder, the cylinder, the, the draw call tree. And then at this point you might be imagining, okay, well, since he already has the, the light gray brush, the dark gray brush, you could probably like draw 
the other cylinders, but no, that's not what happened. I mean, what actually happened is that I have to, usually if those are separate objects, I have to get back to my brush, put my gray brush down, get the same brush again, get back to the canvas and write the, the fourth uh, draw call again. And that goes subsequently. So the fact is here that every draw call has a fixed cost, right? And the more draw calls you have, the amount of time that it takes for you to, you know, go back and forward and doing this uh, grows linearly, right? And, and it, it gets worse, actually. Uh, even if you have like a single model, like on the, the case on the right, uh, you have the single model, but it has two materials, right? It has two different shaders. Even if, you ha even if it's the same model, it has two different shaders, so I have to go back and forth with my brushes anyway. So you get the idea. In general, draw calls, as, as I told you, can have a huge impact on performance. You should be careful with that. Going back and forth, every, every time the renderer needs to send a command, it adds some overhead, and it actually can have a much bigger impact than polycon in some scenarios. Uh, a good place to start finding uh, what is the draw call situation is just in your scene is using stat scene rendering. Uh, and this is, I, I didn't have time to add to this presentation, but a, a really nice tool to use uh, to also debug your draw calls is using a render doc, uh, which is an open source tool. You should probably be using that at this point. And just giving you an overview, these are two cases where we have like millions of triangles, but only uh, 3,000 draw calls, and uh, you have like a mildly decent FPS, like 30, 33 FPS. And the scene on the right with like 44,000 draw calls, and a much way, much less uh, polygons on the scene, but basically running at four FPS because each triangle in the scene is using, using a different material, so yeah. But, okay, uh, how do I work around that? In general, to lower the number of draw calls, um, the, the only approach that we know for now is to use fewer models and larger ones. I mean, to combine models, different objects into single models, right? This is the usual approach that we have to fix those. Uh, the problem is that you can't do that too much because it basically impacts everything else in your game, right? It would be worse for occlusion. So think of, uh, let's say you're making like a, an open world game, so and imagine that you have a building that's like a huge building that's like a single mesh. Even if you're like just close by and looking at the door, the, the engine will still need to consider all those polygons when it's going to render out because you're looking at a really small part of it, but I mean, in fact, the model is like really big, so it, it cannot, I mean, the engine, it cannot split the model into different parts because it's a single thing. But it's basically worse for light mapping. If you're using stat static lighting, you will need more bigger, larger light maps and, and so you can have some detail. It's worse for collision calculation because you lose a lot of the granularity that you could do when you're working with different smaller models. Um, and of course, it's also worse for memory. You're like uh, you're loading uh, larger assets and that can cause hitches. So we're going to go over a few of the things, a few of the features in the engine that can help you do that. Uh, the first, first thing I'm going to talk about is the level of details. I mean, most people know that LODs, they're used to reduce the complexity of scenes, of, of models in general, uh, the vertex complexity of models. But LODs can also use, be used to reduce draw calls. It, it, it's a common uh, workflow to have multi-material uh, in on a single, on a given uh, mesh. Uh, usually, I can give an example, uh, like a tree, you have like a material for the trunk of the tree and they have material for the leaves, uh, so they behave differently to light. Um, with an LOD, you, be, you are, you are able to choose a different set of materials as the model get further from the view. Not only you can have like last polygons, but you can have also maybe have, okay, if this tree is really far, I don't necessarily need to use the same materials that I use when it's close to the, to the camera. So I just switched everything to a single material that has both leaves and tree. It keeps the overall appearance, but I mean, it helps. If your game has, has a lot of vegetation like that, it can help reducing the number of draw calls. 
Uh, modularity, when you're building your levels, modularity is a, is a great thing, right? It makes things much easier to mix and match different pieces and creating gorgeous levels. Uh, it saves a lot of time, but the problem is that it increases the number of draw calls because you're gonna have a lot of, a lot of different objects in your scene, right? So if you're using a modular mesh, work, model, yeah, modular mesh workflow, uh, and there are parts of your level that you're able to merge them into a single mesh, uh, Unreal has a great tool called the merge, I mean, has, you can merge meshes, but it uh, can also merge different actors. So merge actors tools is great for that. Uh, it not only merges uh, all the meshes into a single uh, asset, but also eight lists, do eight lists of the textures of the given materials, create, automatically create simpler materials for you, and eight lists is the, all the textures. So it's all a single textures, and you make sure that it's going to be a single draw call. Uh, also make sure when you're doing that that you have the merge materials option uh, enabled for that. You can also do instance rendering, right? In general, the engine with the render rewrite a few engine versions ago for 21 and 22, I'm, I'm not sure. The engine try, if, you, if your level has lots of static meshes that are, that are I mean, they are the same, they are like the same mesh, the same material, the engine does a good job at auto-instancing and sending those to the GPU in batches. But in some cases, that may not be, how can I say, that? I mean, they may not work as you expect, so you may need to set them manually. We do have some specific features that, in the background, use the instance mesh for, for some features, like for the foliage tool. So everything that you paint in Unreal that uses the foliage tool, uh, it pretty much uh, it's auto-instancing those meshes for you. Uh, also, the grass tool, which is a little bit different, but in, in the end, it uses instance smashing. So, yes, Unreal provides a little bit of the tools that you can use to help you with that, but it also allows you to do that manually if you really need to set up uh, some sort of instance smash actor in your scene. And this is the one I like most. This is our, this is our call hierarchical level of detail, or H lots, and it basically groups different uh, models in your level together to reduce their all calls. So it basically works like the merge actor feature. It actually uses that feature for that. But the, the thing is that it kind of does automatically for you. It's 100% non-destructive. So imagine we have this scene here and you have all those chairs. So what I would basically need to do in Unreal, like I will set up two different areas for these two different set of shares. I will press, I will press bake H lots for me and Unreal will automatically create the merge meshes that represent all those shares, and when I get far from that area, that part of the level, it will automatically switch to the H lot, to the merge, to the merge match mesh it just built. The best part of it is that this is 100% non-destructive. So your, if your level design needs to make adjustments to that, I just I can easily go to a specific share, change the rotation, the scale, do whatever, and basically just press the build button again and Unreal will automatically build your H lots for you. It's great. Okay, let's move on to the GPU thread. So the GPU thread, the, you know, we're finally getting to writing the final pixels on the screen. Uh, and one of the simple, simpler ways to look for problems here to, to, to start is basically turning off features, right? Turn off static meshes, turn off skeletal meshes, turn off particles. So the show flag command uh, is really useful for that. Uh, if you're working on the PC, uh, you could probably pretty much map those to some uh, keyboard shortcuts and you know mix and match stuff and try to uh, maybe find what could be causing issues on your GPU. Uh, also, a hint I could give, it's not on the slide, but um, if you scale the, the frame buffer, I forgot the command right now, but if you scale the frame buffer for zero, it's a really, really nice and simpler way to find out if you're having uh, fill rate issues. Uh, we have the specific, we have a specific command called profile GPU that you're able to run not only in the, in the editor, but also in development builds. Uh, and profile GPU generates a file with uh, the timestamp of the commands that you sent to the GPU. And it makes it really easy for you to check every step of the render of a given frame. And it'll sort that out by time, the time it takes to do that pass and that frame. And you know, maybe find what is causing the issue. 
in a given a specific part of your scene. Uh, it's also accessible via the shortcut, Control-Shift-Coma. Uh, and that's really easy, really, really useful when you need to find out if maybe post-process reflections or volumetric fog uh, is an issue in your game. This is a, an extra hint that uh, I got from Chris Murphy and Marcus Wasner, uh, one of our engineers at Epic. If you use these commands and then you, you use the profile GPU command, now you can profile using, uh, now it shows you the cost, the draw cost per material. Um, it only works on the desktop at this moment, and, but it's a really great if you need to know, I mean, the specific cost for, for a material when it's drawing. The usual problem on the GPU is overshading, right? We know for sure that when you're writing pixels on the screen, that for every, give, every given pixel the GPU is gonna write, uh, you can only show one part of one polygon, right? No matter, I mean, we didn't develop the technology to split pixels in the middle yet. Uh, we probably never will. Uh, but I mean, no matter how detailed your model is, if it's like really far from the player, from the camera, that it occupies just a small portion of the screen, you'll still need to process all those vertices to write very few pixels or detail that you, in the end, cannot see, right? So uh, the general way for you to find out, uh, to fix overshading is using LODs, which we already talked about. Uh, a great way to find these out, uh, this is good for artists when they're reviewing their own content, is using the show, the view mode, the call quad overdraw. This also run in many other platforms. And it basically shows you everything that potentially needs to be lauded, that, that, that potentially needs to have uh, more aggressive LODs, right? It basically goes from a scale from blue to white, and the closer you are to white, uh, the worse as a situation, you should be aware. Shader complexity, it's also great to visualize the complexity of the shaders of, the, of every pixel that you're trying to write on the screen. It's also great to visualize uh, possible overdraw problems. So overdraws may happen not only when you need to do processing for many vertices on the screen, but when you have like, when you use a lot of alpha channel and you need to do like process different um, layers of alpha channel, the engine really doesn't know that who's behind who. So we basically need to process all those, uh, all those surfaces to write the final color of that pixel. So uh, shader complexity is great to show how, how expensive your, your shader is. And as you can see, avoid larger and uh, red and white spots uh, because that will cause issues, right? A few hints that you can use to fix shader uh, complexity issues, right? Uh, the more math you have, the more complex your shader is, the more functions uh, that it has. So try to avoid them. No, no, don't try to avoid them, but be careful when you're doing them. Procedural functions like noise, uh, I mean procedural noise that can be expensive. If you're making your game for the PC and you know for sure that you're going to target the high-end platforms, um, that's okay. If you're going to target mobile or maybe lower-end consoles, uh, you can probably like, switch back to a baked texture for that, that effect, right? Uh, if clauses are also known to be very expensive. And one thing that uh, is really important is I think that Alan uh, touched this in a presentation previously, is that you should probably make a lot of use of the feature level switches and switch parameters, because that allows you to have, to, I mean, to have the best looking shaders for the platforms that you really want them to look like great, but to also have a backup uh, when you need to run this on mobile or on lower end computers, right? Uh, so make good use of these. Uh, and the engine can help, you, can help you optimize that a lot. Because in the end, uh, and that gets a little bit too technical, when, when you're going to cook your game for the, the specific platform that you're working, uh, the engine will only use that path, that shader code that is relative to that platform that is going to run that. So keep that in mind. Uh, general 
uh, ideas that you can use. Uh, consider moving complex calculations to be vertex-based instead of pixel-based. That's, that's kind of important in mobile. It's kind of useful in mobile because uh, mobile, I mean, you're playing in a, a smaller screen, so it's hard uh, to see all the details of the shader effects. That's very, but also very useful for PC games, I mean, depending on the kind of effect that you're trying to create. Instead of changing the final appearance of a model of a shader for every pixel, uh, you could do all that calculation interpolating by vertices, so it could reduce a lot of uh, processing power that it needs. Vertex interpolator nodes are great for that, but some framework, some uh, workflows, like when you're doing tessellation or when you're using displacement, still you need to use the custom UV workflow. Basically, you select your material node and you add a few custom UVs and you do crazy math and the output of that UV uses the texture coordinate set to, to the UV that you're doing that the calculation and then you can get that result and do crazy stuff. These are one of the very few things that the engine uh, can automatically optimize for you. So when you're using particles, in general, particles are, you know, uh, meshes are planes with transparent uh, textures applied to it. And so the engine is able to automatically cut out the, uh, the, the image right close to the alpha of that image that it's trying to render. So you, you have like a, a smaller chance or at least it reduces the amount of overdraw for that given particle. So use that uh, uh, in your advantage. Uh, this can also be applied to grass planes even though the engine doesn't do that automatically for you, but that's a good uh, thing to follow. Uh, if, you, if your game has a lot of vegetation or maybe have uh, grass, needs to simulate grass in the game, you can, you, it's a good practice to you know, cut your, even if you're adding more polygons, cut your uh, grass planes to be closer to the shape of the texture so you can reduce or withdraw that. And sometimes even some games don't even use translucency at all. They basically just, it's cheaper. Of course, that depends on the game, that that depends on the platform that you're working. Uh, but sometimes for some platforms, it's cheaper to cut to actually have model grass and model vegetation and not use uh, translucency at all, just lose the regular shader. And you, in, in some cases, you can get like a better performance than that. And to wrap that up, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about light complexity. Light complexity, I mean, lights can, can add a lot of cost to the GPU in your game. So the light, light complexity view mode, it's really good to identifying uh, issues, performance issues with your lighting. Uh, most importantly, it's, it, all the known static, all the dynamic or stationary lights that you use in your game. So as you can expect, the, the wider the, more, the wider it gets, uh, the more complex uh, your scene is, so it makes it easier for artists and anyone to identify those issues. But general, general hints that I can give you about light complexity, uh, of course, Minimize the number of dynamic lights. Uh, those are rendered in real time, every frame, and the GPU needs to do a lot of uh, work and math to compute the final color of that pixel that it's, uh, it's lighting. So minimize the number of dynamic lights. If you really need to use them, you should probably uh, minimize the radius so it only is only lighting the areas that is really important for you in that part of the level. Um, you can also reduce the number of things that dynamic lights can affect. You can use cha light channels for objects and light. Uh, shadow casting is also really expensive. So if you have a dynamic light that you don't really need to, to cast shadows, turn that off. If you're talking about stationary light, uh, you should be careful with uh, stationary light overlap. You can only have like three uh, lights overlapping. If you had another one, then the engine uh, we'll show you that like red X icon and what basically that means is that this is a dynamic light now and that's gonna be way more expensive. It's also, we can also cool dynamic lights as early as possible. This is something that we do a lot in Fortnite. Uh, we do have some dynamic lights inside buildings, but uh, once the player is farther from it or outside the building, we basically turn all them off and they're not rendering, they're not taken into consideration uh, to the render. And I mean, yes, in general, if you can use the static lighting, uh, the more you can use, uh, the better performance you get. Of course, that the, the trade-off between aesthetic and dynamics, that the more aesthetic lights, I mean, 
not the more. I mean, if, if you use a static lice, it means that you're going to need to write uh, light maps to the disk and that increase memory use. So this is a, you know, a trade-off and balance, things that need to be balanced. And uh, that's it. Thank you.